focus on electric microscopy on the left. So all of these are of the lab strain, because again, I said I found a lot of vesicles for the lab strain, and so it's easier to work with. So most of this data will come from that strain, unless otherwise noted. So as you can see, you see a ton of these little vesicles that range in size from maybe 40 to up to about 400 nanometers in diameter. You also see a little um, flagella contamination. Um, but as an example, when I look at the environmental strain under the same conditions, in this same frame, I might find one vesicle, if I'm lucky. That kind of tells you the extreme difference between these strains. Um, I can also utilize embedded um, transmission electron microscopy, which basically slices through the pellet. So instead of looking at the vesicles from the surface by negative staining, I can slice through the pellet and look at the membrane. And as you can see, there's different densities of these vesicles, and they come in many different sizes, and you can even see the bilayer of the membrane. So now that I can see these vesicles, again, since there are people that don't really think they're real, maybe I can get some images of the vesicles coming out of cells and being produced by the cells. So I was able to do that, again, with embedded TDM. Um, I have images of these little putative vesicles coming out. Um, I can also use SEM to kind of scanning electron microscopy to kind of show maybe a 3D version where you see these little putative vesicles. Um, they also align with the same size uh, that we find these vesicles, so that's awesome. Um, and we also, I also did some more to look at these uh, protruding. This is negative staining of the cell. You see these little guys, little guys coming out um, of the membrane, and again, with the embedded TEM, you can see them forming. One thing that would be really awesome and would get all these people off my back about these vesicles being real would be to have a movie of this happening. However, we don't have an electron microscope that can do movies yet. So hopefully that will happen someday. Um, so now I've just seen images of these, and now it's time to find out more about these vesicles. Um, the first step is to find out how big they are, how big the diameter is, are they similar to other vesicles that have been isolated from other organisms? And kind of the gold standard to figure out this diameter is a dynamic light scattering. It's a machine that can basically utilize a laser to shine it at particles and then measure the amount of light scattering, which will go back and approximate the hydrodynamic diameter of these spheres. So the idea is that larger particles won't scatter as much light as small particles. So the machine does a ton of um, equations that I still can't wrap my head around completely and hopefully will someday, and we'll end up spitting out a uh, distribution of the sizes of these particles in the, um, in the sample. So here on the right is the dynamic light scattering results. Um, you see these two peaks around 50 millimeters and 200. These two peaks are very common when looking at um, vesicles. Any kind of organism, any vesicles from any organism always show, almost always show these two peaks. And it also is in range of vesicles from other organisms, so this is great too. Um, another way to measure these diameters is to do it directly from the images, the images I showed you earlier. So I went in and measured a ton of them and found that the average is around 125 nanometers. Um, the only problem with this is that we're trying to measure a 3D diameter from a 2D image, which doesn't really work that well. So there's been a um, uh, 1.27 correction factor where I can basically take all my diameters and multiply it by this factor that should help correct for that. Um, and so it does increase the mean size of these vesicles. But as you notice, the average is still somewhat lower, maybe 150 in the EM compared to the dynamic light scattering, which is centered around 200. This can also be explained by the EAM underestimating size because it goes through many stages of dehydration and um, that sort of thing. You tend to have a smaller size in your images than what it actually is. But nevertheless, all of this points to the same what has been seen in other vegetables. So now that I know what they look like and I know the diameter, I want to know what's in them and why, why are they important. So I did some proteomics where I sent off to my collaborators from Spain and found that vegetable preparations compared to cell preparations are enriched in 24 different proteins. Um, of these 24 proteins, half of them are liver proteins. This is important because um, MTB vesicles have been found to have a be enriched in liver proteins, so this becomes a little more relevant. Um, the other thing that was really interesting is that I found five siderophore binding proteins. I'll talk a little bit more about siderophores later, but to let you know, there are seven siderophore proteins produced by the cell, so to find five of them completely enriched in this vesicle was really interesting. Um, I also mentioned before that these vesicles and gram negatives can have antibiotic resistant proteins. This vesicle, these vesicle preparations found, um, I was able to find a immunity protein to sublancin. Sublancin is an antibiotic produced.
by Bacillus subtilis. So it's pretty cool that it has its own immunity protein in these vesicles. Maybe it plays some kind of role in the cell. Um, and all of this all of this data I've shown you so far has been from these liquid planktonic cultures. But as we know, most bacteria don't live in liquid, rich liquid media in the lab. They live outside in a biofilm. So I wanted to try to find if these vesicles um, can be found in biofilm, found naturally in the environment. So I had a rotation student help me with this. And we grew lab strain and environmental strain biofilms for our reporting in eight days. And we wanted to isolate vesicles from these biofilms. As you can see with the EM, we find vesicles. Awesome. And then we measure the um, diameters by the EM. And as you can see, they're a little smaller. They're closer to 100 and less than what we got from the planktonic. So that is one difference that we found with these uh, biofilm vesicles. Um, however, when you do the dynamic light scattering, again, it's a little bit bigger. And like I said, that could be due to the underestimation by the EM. But it's good to know that these vesicles are in the environment or an environmental state. <coughs> Also, we wanted to find out if we could actually see the vesicles within the biofilm instead of just isolating them from the biofilm. So this top image shows an embedded TDM, a slice through of the biofilm, and as you can see, there are some vesicles present. Um, and we also did some SEM of a biofilm where this SEM um, sample was actually frozen and cut in the middle, so you're looking at the inside of the biofilm. You can see there are vesicle protrusions that we've seen before and the cell. So this is really interesting. Um, then we want to get back to this idea that I found strains that produce differing amounts of vesicles. Um, when we talk about DLS, this was also one of, besides the pellet, one of the first things that kind of indicated maybe there's something going on between these strains. So we have our lab strain that I've shown before that is somewhat, you see your normal two peaks. But when you look at the environmental strain as well as some other ones, don't worry about the names, um, you see this contamination. So when I filter these, I filter them through 450 nanometer filters. So really, there shouldn't be anything that's bigger than that. Um, but as you've also seen in the EM photos, there are some flagella contamination. So my working hypothesis about this is that the lab strain has so many vesicles that the machine is able to um, measure those diameters very well. Whereas because these other strains make fewer vesicles, the noise becomes so loud that it's able to uh, read these flagella, which are not spherical, the machine is used to measuring spheres, and so you get this noise background. <coughs> um, I've basically been able to use this um, light scattering as kind of a first indicator before doing other experiments. And the good thing about using this light scattering is I can use my sample again. I don't have to waste the sample like any EM, their sample's gone. So this is kind of the gold standard of looking at vesicles in the first place. So now that I've talked about that these strains might make different amounts of vesicles, how do, I, how do I quantify this? How do I measure this other than saying I see it in a picture or this there could be contamination in the light scattering? One thing that we can do is utilize radio labeling. So I can take carbon-14 palmitic acid, put it into the culture, and the cells will incorporate it into their membrane, which in turn we would assume would be into the membrane that would form vesicles. Um, and we kind of scale down the way that we isolate the vesicles grow with the carbon-14 over um, until it doubles, clean it up so you get rid of all of the extra radioactivity, so you assume the only radioactivity there is in the cell and in the cell membrane. Um, let it grow overnight, take up the cells um, as before, filter it again to get rid of a lot of the debris, and concentrate it so you can work with a smaller volume, and then ultrasound damage. So each of those fractions um, are saved because they're really all of the parts that have been radio labeled, and then you can graph them as a percentage. And as you can see here, the lab strain has a really high level of radioactivity in the pellet compared to the environmental strain. So this is yet another um, example or another piece of data that suggests that these are making various amounts of um, uh, vesicles. Um, one way to also directly look at the lipids of these vesicles is to run a thin layer chromatography plate. So basically I took these um, cells and I took vesicles that were labeled and then I extracted their lipids and I put this on the, on the plate, which then will run and separate based on polarity. So in each lane, in the first lane, we have the lab strain cells and the lab strain vesicles, and you can see that the density, the brightness of the spots are very similar. Whereas when you take the environmental cells and the environmental vesicles, it's kind of hard to see the environmental vesicles. Um, one thing to note is that all of these cells have incorporated about the same amount of radioactivity. So it's not an issue of maybe the environmental strain incorporated a quarter of the radioactivity that the lab strain did. So 
So it really indicates that these decibels, there are fewer of them. So now we can go back to that question of, are vesicles real? It's been really hard to completely prove this to people because none of all the people that question it can't come up with an experiment and tell me to do. So one experiment that my boss and I came up with that I think is really cool is kind of utilize a small molecule that we can put into the media and assume that if these vesicles are forming in the media, breaking up, forming in the media, they can encapsulate this molecule, right? Whereas if the cell, if the cell is producing these vesicles, directly from the cell, this molecule won't get inside. So in our lab, since we study cryptococcus neoformans, we happen to have a lot of GXM, which is the polysaccharide um, of the capsule of cryptococcus neoformans. We also have an antibody to it. So I decided, since we have this, let's try to use that as our small molecule. Um, I was able to concentrate it down also so that it's very small, below 10 kb in size, so we can assume that it's small enough to be able to be encapsulated by these vesicles. So I can grow them overnight with the GSM, purify the vesicles, and then do a Google um, PM. So I do my PM images, and we can utilize this antibody to put the immune cell on, and we can find out where this GSM is. Is it in the vesicles? Is it outside the vesicles? Where is it? So there are a couple options that can happen. First, like I said, if vesicles are produced by the cell, you won't see any GSM inside the vesicles. Whereas if vesicles are formed in the media, they will encapsulate this GXM so they can see the goal on the image. But as a control, I also utilized a vesicle prep that I sonicated. So I distributed all of these vesicles to kind of uh, make fake vesicles or mimic vesicles that would be forming in the media. So I would expect that these would encapsulate the GXM. And so when I did my images, you get something like this where you can see the vesicles and the arrow, the ves black arrows are vesicles and then the amino gold. And here you see that most of this gold is outside of vesicles. So I went into a lot of pictures of both the sonicated and natural preparations and counted the number of vesicles that had gold in them and the number of vesicles that didn't. And so I get something like this. Natural vesicles have very, very small percentage of them have the gold inside. There's going to be some error, so <coughs> you're going to have that. But the sonicated vesicles have a significantly increased amount of gold inside of them indicating that not only is, is there an ability for these vesicles to encapsulate, which also proves the point of doing this experiment, but when you make uh, disrupted vesicles or you disrupt vesicles, they do come back together and encapsulate this GXM, meaning that natural vesicles coming from the cell do not break up in media, and so you have no GXM inside of them. So I have this information, but what else can I look at um, about the vesicles from these two different preparations? One thing would be to look at the diameters. Um, since I'm disrupting vesicles, they're coming back together, potentially are they different from the natural vesicles? After measuring a lot of diameters, a lot, a lot of diameters, um, I found that, as you can see here, natural vesicles have a very large range of their size. It has a median around 125-ish. Um, however, the sonicated vesicles are incredibly statistically significantly different. Um, they also have a much smaller range. Um, which kind of indicates that when they break up and come back together, this is more of a stable size, whereas the natural vesicles are able to be formed in many different sizes. Um, and again, going back to wanting to try to quantitate these um, strains, one thing we can also try to utilize is the density gradient. This density gradient will um, also tell us um, how dense these vesicles are, which is a little bit extra information. Um, again, I utilize radioactive uh, vesicles, so I've labeled them the same way as before. I put them into this gradient at the bottom. It's a discontinuous gradient where I very tediously layer these other percentages of this uh, chemical optiprep. And when I spin it overnight, these, this gradient will become continuous, and the vesicles will either move up or down into whatever density they become with equal of them. So once I do that, I can actually take out fractions from the top, half mil fractions, and plot the amount of radioactivity. This graph is a little messy, so we'll go through it slowly. First, again, showing with the heat killed or any kind of killed, um, showing that these vesicles are not formed from these killed cells, I, brought, I used some of those vesicles. And as you can see with the black open circles, it does not look like the other, uh, other distributions. It just has a really small, little density particle when it goes down. Whereas these other strange <coughs> vesicles have this more of a peak in the middle. So we'll start with the last strain, as I mentioned before, produces more vesicles, so we see that. We see it much higher than the others. Um, and then we have the environmental, which is the black square, so it's very low. So this is great. It also boosts what I've seen with the other experiments. So I wanted to try to 
thinking back to these, gen these um, genes that are different, or these mutations that are different between these strains, one that I identified is this gene SFP. Um, so when I take a strain of the lab strain, or the lab strain has a mutation in SFP, so it's not functional. Whereas the environmental strain has a complete copy of SFP and it is functional. So those are the two differences there. And when I take the lab strain and add a wild type copy of the SFP back in, which is the green triangle, you lose the ability to make all these vesicles. That's encouraging. So then I take the environmental strain, which normally has a full copy of SFP, and I go in and delete it. If it's the orange here, you see it increases. So now I've been able to change the amount of vesicles being produced by changing one gene. So maybe this gene is involved in vesicle production. So what does SFP do? Um, it's actually involved in making bacillobactin, which is a spherophore, as well as surfactin, which is an antibiotic, and maybe some unidentified pathway that hasn't been studied yet. And so the first, we'll talk about surfactin first. Surfactin, like I said, is an antibiotic. Don't get too bogged down with the picture. Um, it's made non-ribosomally, and so SFP comes in, into play where it actually transfers a phosphopantothrine uh, moiety from CoA onto these peptidyl carrier proteins. So it happens right about, not in there, but it happens on this SRFA, SRFA module, um, and since that's locked in the lab strain, it's unable to make the surfactant. You can't get surfactant. Whereas in the environmental strain, you do get surfactant. This is what surfactant looks like after it's made. Um, and some qualities about surfactant is they're actually conflicting. Some, um, some work has shown that surfactant can actually break up limits, um, act as a detergent, break them up, and even uh, scatter them. Or there's other work that has shown that also acting as a detergent breaks them up, but makes them form micelles. So this is interesting because we're talking about the micelle-like object. And so what is, what is one way? Maybe the gene isn't necessarily involved in affecting the vessels, but the surfactant is doing something in the media. To maybe the cells make the same amount of vesicles, but surfactant in the media is affecting them. So one, one um, experiment I can do, remember this surf A, is take my environmental strain and delete this surf A gene. So instead of affecting SFP, I affect something else in that pathway. Um, and I find these uh, maroon and green triangles, they still have really low vesicle production. So surfactant is probably not affecting or cis, it's SFP itself. Um, I also have this blue triangle that I put in. It's another strain of the lab strain where SFP has been added back in, but it was made by another lab, just because I wanted to confirm that there wasn't some lab specific issue. So it also, by having a fully functional SFP, you make way less vesicles. Whereas when you have a mutation in SFP, a non-functional version, you produce a lot of vesicles. So there's, that leaves bacillobactin or some unidentified pathway. Bacillobactin, as I mentioned, is a sidorophore. Um, iron is in the environment, but it's insol insoluble, so bacteria have a hard time using it. They utilize these sidorophores, which are iron chelators, to go out, bind to the iron, make it soluble, bring it back to the cell, binds to the sidorophore binding protein, which I mentioned before, and bring it into the cell. So again, lab strain has a mutation in SFP, can't make this bacillobactin. Environmental strain can. The other interesting thing, as I mentioned, sidorophore binding proteins, <coughs> is that even though the cell subtilis makes bacillobactin, and that's its sidorophore, it has the ability to acquire sidorophores from other organisms. For example, enterobactin is produced by E. coli, basically in a very homologous pathway. And atomic acid is actually the precursor to bacillobactin, so in the lab strain, since it has a mutation in SFP, it stops at that point, and you just have atomic acid. So atomic acid can bind to iron, but it's thought that since it's so weak, it's not really physiologically relevant. And again, just to show you that enterobactin and bacillobactin look very, very similar, um, and they're both made the same way. Here again is uh, the non-ribosomal synthesis, so SFP is involved here, moving the phosphopantothine remedy from coenzyme onto the peptidyl carrier protein. Also, interestingly, bacillus and brasis, it makes two sidorophores tetrabactin as well as bacillobactin. So, and braces probably has maybe similar pathways, similar proteins. So I can utilize this bacillus finding this gene, then go into ambraces and do the same experiments to see if this gene affects the same thing as ambraces. And back to where I mentioned sidorophore binding proteins. 
Um, I said that there are seven different ones. So these proteins are able to basically steal sideriforus from other organisms. For example, petrobactin from anthracis, the enterobactin from E. coli. And the cool thing is that five of the seven were found associated with the vesicles. So this kind of prompts a little more uh, towards the bacillobactin iron story and how this is affecting vesicle production. Don't know what it is yet, but that will be the next step. So my conclusions so far are that bacillus subtilis makes vesicles. They're similar morphology and size to um, vesicles from other organisms. Um, they can be visualized within um, cultures as well as isolated from cultures. Um, the last strain is a potential vesicle hyperproducer because as we've seen the large palette, tons of vesicles in the picture, I don't need to use large cultures to isolate amount of vesicles to work with. Um, they are actually made by the cell. They're not formed by license of cells in the media or aggregation of lipids. They are formed purposefully by the cell. Um, the gene SFP affects vesicle production. The really cool thing about this is that it's the first time that any gene has ever been identified in gram positives that it affects vesicle production. Granted, there hasn't been a lot of study on them yet, but this is still really exciting. If we can understand how these vesicles are being formed. I've done the experiments that show that surfactant is not the pathway that's being affected. Um, so it's either the cell vaccine or it's an identified pathway. Um, but, and that's, yeah. So just some future work that I would want to do is figure out what does this iron, what does this slow vaccine have to do with vesicles? What, how is it coming to play? What's the mechanism? Some experiments I can do is look at vesicle production under different iron conditions, lower iron, higher iron, of the various strains that have the ability to make a severe or a dome. Um, I could also try vesicle rescue. What if the bacillobactin is somehow associated with these vesicles? If I add vesicles from a severe or positive strain to one that doesn't have it, can it help rescue the growth or even change how many vesicles that's making? Um, is, could these because these vesicles contain the sideropore binding proteins, could they even be a sideropore scavenger? So a scavenger for the scavenger? We'll have to look into it. And also, do exogenous sideropores. If I add sideropores to the strains that don't make sideropores, is it able to reduce the number of vesicles being made? Does it change the number of vesicles being made? And I can also utilize um, the enterobactin or any of the other sideropores that the um, bacterium is able to collect rather than just its own. Um, also, one thing that I can do to look and see if there was an unidentified pathway is kind of what I did in the surfactant is make a mutation elsewhere in the bacillobactin pathway than the SFP and see if that affects how these or the amount of vesicles made. Also, biofilm is, in, is studied very in-depthly in bacillus subtilis. So as you saw, um, vesicles are important for pseudomonas biofilm, so I'd like to look at more on uh, what role these vesicles play in biofilm formation. Um, and one thing that these subtilis vesicles could also be helpful in is uh, looking and see if they elicit an immune response, because maybe they could be used as an adjuvant for vaccines or for other vesicle vaccines if they are able to elicit this immune response. So again, the significance of this is that it's a tractable model for studying these gram positives that are harder to work with. Um, we could also utilize this type of production to uh, be more efficient, whether there's something that is packaged inside the vesicles and we want to make a lot of it, um, for example, the surfactant made by Bacillus subtilis is harvested for many uses, um, but it also makes studying this much more efficient than using strains that don't make very many vesicles. Um, we could also identify therapeutic and vaccine targets. So, for example, the anthracis, it has the toxins inside the vesicles. If there's a way that we can prevent vesicles from being produced, can we prevent disease? Um, and like I said, we could also maybe use this as an adjuvant. I'd like to thank my lab, um, especially Arturo, who is a very supportive, wonderful boss. Uh, my current and past members, especially Julie, who you might know, who has taught me many, many of these techniques. Um, uh, my committee members, who hopefully let me graduate someday. Uh, the imaging facility, which has really helped me take some really, really cool EM pictures um, and teach me how to use the microscope. Rotation student Annie, who did some of the biofilm work. Um, the proteomics was done in Spain with my collaborators, and um, the Losick lab at Harvard has provided a lot of these trains, um, also just taught me about subtlets. Um, so I'd like to thank all of them. I can't do it without them.